Welcome back to the Game Dev Show. My name is Luke Greenaway, and this week I am joined by Oddworld Inhabitants founder, the masterminds behind the incredible Oddworld series, designer of worlds, maker of myths, crafter of personalities, <laughs> Lorne Lanning. Lorne, how are you? I'm good, Luke. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> and uh, thank, thank you for that great introduction. <laughs> I, think, I read that somewhere. I think I might have wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> you did, you did. <laughs> oh, okay, is it a bio? <laughs> word for word. <laughs> okay. I was like, mine is too boring. You know, it was probably like Twitter or Facebook. Or something. It's like, Twitter. Too, it's too boring. Is- yeah, so I just changed it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, how are you? I'm good. I'm uh, I'm doing I'm doing real good. We were talking just before the show, you know, and we just relocated to uh, Sedona, Arizona, which is um, a lot of people claim is the most beautiful place in the world. And I've been all over the world, and different places have different qualities, but this place is just beyond <laughs> epic. You know, how did this happen? So that's fabulous. You know, I was uh, on the West Coast, just real quick, when I first went there, I grew up on the East Coast of the United States in New England. And then I moved to the West Coast back in 87. And I love the West Coast. But uh, it's really harsh. And living in the environment, you know, I had kind of grown up in living in the dry, sort of uh, barren, highly managed environment of California. It wound up a lot less interactive and alive than I had thought. Like I lived right on the bay in San Francisco. And where I grew up, let's say in a healthy ecosystem, and there's still, you know, great white sharks and shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> big stuff in there. But you walk around on the shoreline and you don't have things skittering out. You know, it's a port uh, city, Oakland. So you wind up with a lot of parasites and water, things like this. But you just don't see that life. And I was really getting to miss that, you know, especially through COVID lockdown and all that. And you're in a city and there was just none of that oxygen of natural life that yeah. I really thrive on. And so I, I feel uh, I'm replenishing on that out here. So I've got you know, <laughs> scorpions, tarantulas, <laughs> rattlesnakes, Man. all kinds of shit, uh, like golden eagles, uh, you know, mountain lions, uh, lynxes, uh, bobcats. There's all kinds of things out here. <laughs> uh, coyotes running through the war. The biggest coyotes I've ever seen in my life just walking through the yard. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> let's, let's get the two hours in now. You know? <laughs> that so, is crazy. So I'm really feeling um, creatively regenerated. And, mm-hmm. uh, or I should say, you know, on a good path to regeneration, like uh, a lizard losing his tail or something. <laughs> <laughs> <It's growing laughs> that Man, that's great. I love that metaphor as well. That's really cool. And it, man, it's always, it's all about being out in the wild. I believe so. Yeah, it really is. I think we get sucked into this, like, not to digress, but this rat race of like, let's move to the city, let's move to the city. But actually, I live like in, say, the suburb slash country in the UK, and we used to move live in the city. And yeah. we don't have like mountain lions or like coyotes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got like cows. And uh, yeah. like- <laughs> well, so you've got badgers too. I know badgers. because I, I really angered one one time up in uh, Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In a town called Otley, yeah. Hey, how did <laughs> yeah. you anger a badger? Like, well, uh, I had I, – okay, so I'll, I'll tell the story. So real quick, I'm staying in this lodge, which is up on the top of this, uh, you know, significant hill. And from it – it's a you know, really, really cool place. And from it, you can see these, like, mountains off in the distance. And the guys on the crew – were telling me, they go, yeah, that's Mordor. That's Tolkien was up here writing and that's Mordor. There was mountains. I was like, wow, check this out. And so in the mornings I'd, I'd go for this walk because it was kind of in the woods up there, a very, very English countryside type of forest. You know, you can walk lots of moss, lots of plants, lots of thin trees. And you think you can see far, you know, <laughs> like you don't really, there's things out there like big bucks that you don't even see, but they're standing right there. So and, I, and at this hotel, I was like, you know, it's amazing. No one's ever out here walking in these kind of, I guess, like, you know, boggy kind of ponds and uh, woods. So I would go out there every morning. I'm walking around. It's just frog beds. or spring. You know, the eggs are there. And I get excited about watching that kind of stuff. And uh, one day I'm walking through there and there's never anyone out there. Right. And so I'm walking through there and all of a sudden I hear this thing. It's like. Like, like this really angry little like sound but it wasn't so you know it was like a growl and all of a sudden these two bucks just i didn't even see them and they were probably 
they were big, you know, and big racks and horns, deer, and they just shoot out. And they were only like 15 feet away from me. And I can see perfect, but they just camouflaged them perfectly. And I was like, <laughs> that's, the, that's the strangest sounding deer I've ever heard in my life, right? And now they're gone. And I'm standing on this, you know, it feels like a pretty sturdy little area. And then I hear it again. It's like, <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, it's right underneath me. And I was standing on its den, you know, and <laughs> and I had been chased by a badger once before in Connecticut <laughs> down, a, down a ski slope in the summer. So I was familiar with the sound, but it just, I saw the deer and the sound at the same time. It didn't make sense. So I go back into the lodge and I'm like, do you guys have badgers out there? And they're like, oh yeah, you don't want to go walking out there. <laughs> I was like, Where's the sign? <laughs> like, maybe you don't want to go hiking through this beautiful ponds and forests because oh. there's badgers out there. And uh, yeah, so that was <laughs> that was just, uh, like 2014, I think. Yeah. Way back when, I don't want to say how far back, you studied motion graphics, animation, visual effects. It was like yeah. art and animation, was, was that always something you were interested in? Well, yeah, because as a, as a little kid, that's really where I I shined. You know, it was, it was just a natural thing. I remember my dad; he said that was the moment moment I knew you might make money in art. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I think I was five or six. I saw all these birds in the yard, and I was like, How come we don't have a birdhouse? You know, we need a birdhouse. They need a house, and it was you know, winter's coming. And, shit. and I was just, there's no house for the birds, you know, and. So my dad, who was uh, formerly naval nuclear subs, but after that, he was electronics packaging design, which was like designing circuit boards and making things fit oh, cool. uh, in consumer electronics and such. And he said, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you design one? You know, we'll see if we can make it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went off <laughs> and I designed a birdhouse in uh, three views, like the way later we would be digitizing things before 3D digitizers, when you had to always draw three views and then you yeah. digitize the front, the side, you know, and you get your proportions. It's like pre cyber scanning. And he looked at it and he looked at me and he looked at her and he looked at my mom and he went, He got his brains from me. <laughs> that was like, I was like, I didn't really know what was going on. But uh, so then he took that in and it hung in his work for years, you know, and uh, I just didn't think much of it because I kind of, I just thought in 3D, I think part of the reason was. My father was in nuclear subs, so he'd be gone for months at a time when I was a little kid. And my mother had a globe, and she'd sort of say, well, you know, your father's probably somewhere up here. So it, it gave me this sense of, like, the world is round, and people are in different places, and it's not over there. It's over there. You know, like, it was dimensional. And so maybe that was part, and seeing what he did was there was always blueprints and uh you know, like real old school blueprints on blue paper with blue lines. It was all hand charted. So I was really interested in like diagrams, and maps and, and things that plotted, you know, dimensionally. And then just drawing just came really naturally. And uh, it was a way as a little kid, like I remember first, second, third grade, we were drawing hot rods and chopper Harleys no. and, and things like that. And then selling the other kids for their lunch money and shit. You know, so like in elementary school, I was selling it for lunch money. And then eventually in high school, I was forging people's, you know, <laughs> IDs so they could get into <laughs> the bars. You know? It escalated quickly. Like. Yeah, it escalated. So it went from like 25 cents, a, a little piece of work to 100 bucks per. And so I learned that, you know, art was a way that, A, stimulated me tremendously. And I remember that really came in like uh, 76. I think it was 76 when the Art of Star Wars book came out. And my dad bought that for me. And then, you know, looking at the work of uh, Ralph McQuarrie and uh, the rest of the crews, you know, Phil Tippett and the stuff that was going on at ILM, I was like, I, I was just in shock. You know, I didn't, Star Wars also, you know, kind of took sci-fi to another level like Kubrick had done with 2001. And then you didn't have any movies like it. You had a lot of cheap imitations for a long time, right? But then you saw Star Wars and you were teleported to that world. I didn't know that art could lead to film. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I still didn't really connect the dots for myself because I was just, I was really interested in, in the actual designing, the drawing, the quality of how you draw and how you paint and this stuff. And then I figured that's the only way I'm going to make any money in life. 
you know, you're young and you're trying to figure out like, how am I going to survive? And I had that mm. problem, you know, my family didn't have money at all. And, you know, there was divorce and it was, without getting into complications, but it was like, how am I going to survive? And when you're in cold climates, mm. you know, and you see like homeless people and freezing people, you know, you see the stuff and you go, I don't want to end up like that. You know, yeah. I don't want to end up like that. So I was really a bit paranoid about that as a kid. I was like, how am I going to survive in the future on my own? And it was the computer graphics that I saw in probably 80, 84, 85, 85, I think, in New York. And I was going to school of visual arts to become an illustrator. I got to meet the illustrators that I was the biggest fans of, except the guys on the West Coast, like Ralph McQuarrie and Sid Mead, you know, Blade Runner. I, but I'd meet them later. But in New York, <laughs> I was meeting just the, the illustrators that were working, you know, in – uh, advertising and uh, what they call editorial, you know, covers of Time Magazine, like big people. But when I saw how they were living, I was like, I, I don't want to live like this. <laughs> I, th I think it was like, being an illustrator was like the perfect kind of existence for an introvert that just wanted to mm -hmm. be home and, and, and do their own thing and focus on it. And I knew some people like that. They did really were, but they were the first ones to tell you, I'm an introvert and I love this job. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I just want to, I can't be alone like that for the rest of my life. And then, uh, when I saw what was happening with computer graphics, there was, there was a kind of lightning bolt moment for me. There was a number of them, but the, I'm trying to give you one I haven't told before. One was, I was working out, I was like, well, advertising illustration most, makes the most money. And I was, remember I was trying to do this painting where a high rise, like a Manhattan glass high rise, the whole midsection was like a whiskey bottle and had Jack Daniels logo, but everything was going to be painted like photorealistic, you know? So, so that was my, my goal. And that's what I was majoring in really was, or at least targeting was photorealism, sort of fantasy photorealism, right? And I spent so much time on this drawing, you know, just getting all the perspective right on the elevated floors and then getting the logo to be right at the perspective and making the liquid of like 40 floors in the midsection of a high rise was like Jack Daniels. You know? <laughs> and it was really a tremendous lot. Of, I probably had a hundred hours into the drawing and it wasn't even a painting yet. And, you know, and part of it, I was still learning. So I'm erasing a lot. And um, very shortly after that, there was this rep at a company called Andrulli and Bernstein, which was kind of a, a big representative for a freelance artist, maybe the biggest in New York. One of the art directors, you know, someone arranged for me to go down. And he was going to show me some stuff of what was going on and what kind of people would get work. And this guy showed me this this videotape, he goes, check this stuff out. It's coming out of LA. Like, this is the hot stuff. And first, I'm going to book you a tour at, uh, it was called Charlux in New York. He arranges for me. He goes, you got, you got to see what's going on in uh, Los Angeles. But someone's doing it here in New York. It's called Charlux. And it was the first, like, digital compositing house and digital beginnings of digital video in any production. But it was happening mostly in commercials. So then he shows me this reel from a company in Los Angeles. It was Digital Productions in Robert Abel Associates. He showed me sort of this combination reel. And they had like STP oil, you know, Valvoline oil with four wheels can of oil driving through a countryside. And it was all this 3D animation. And the art director, he was like, look at that. Look at how the logo stays perfect. <laughs> the shit they cared about, right? It was like, can the people see the logo the whole time? And, you know, and he's just like, look at it, it's perfect. It's perfect. Like, that's why they don't use photography. They use illustration because we get it really crystal clear, you know, perfect. There. You hear all these stories. And I was like, wow. And I was thinking about the building I was still working on. I was like, you mean I could just build it in 3D? And the perspective would figure itself out because it's real cameras and shit like that. You know, and I was reading by that time, I think the art of ILM book had come out and it was a thick book and it was like 120 bucks, which at that time was like a fortune. And I saved up and I bought the book and I was seeing how they did the motion control and the stop motion. It's like, wow, you know, Dragon Slayer, young Sherlock Holmes, all these old movies they were doing. And it was just remarkable. But, but I was like, wow, it can figure out perspective for you, mm. the computer. And seeing all that, it kind of blew my mind. But then very shortly thereafter, I did go to Charlex. And at that time, I was making spare money at night, retouching uh, models for like uh, 
some photographers that work for Mary Kay Cosmetics. And so they, they'd come in and they go, we need a retoucher on top of the photo. And we need to get rid of these pimples or this, this line or this hair. You know, you need to get rid of those. And now this was old, old school physical. The day before I go to Charlex, I'm working on one of those photos. And like a model, but she had pimples and they didn't want them. So I was supposed to take them out. And I just couldn't match the skin tone. Wasn't that skilled yet to, to figure it out. And I literally spent like six, seven hours. There. And so I was up all night into the morning. And it was still a, a, a school. I was still going to school. And I was just really wrecked. And then I go in for this morning tour of Charlex that I wasn't going to meet. And they go, oh, check out this thing. We call it a paint box. And this is before Photoshop and all of that, right? It was called paint box, Quantel paint box. And it was the standard if you could afford it. And it was, you know, over, I don't remember what the price was. It was a fortune. No, no individuals were buying it. You know, post-production companies would buy it or production companies would have it. And uh, they said, now what you can do with this is we've scanned this model, <laughs> you know, here's, and look, oh, there's some pimples we'd like to take out. It was like exactly <laughs> what I was spending all night on the demo. And the guy goes, and so we just take this up to the screen. Beep. And we want the color here beep, to go here. There it is. And I was like, I, I was completely floored. I was like, oh, my God, I'm out of business. Like, I haven't even started. And there's no way I'm going to be able to compete with that. The guy did it in one second. I was up for six, seven hours trying to solve that problem. And so I was very quickly realizing computers weren't what I thought they were. This happened in a jam-packed concentration of time. I had no interest in it all of a sudden. I was like, my God, I've, I've got to learn it. And uh, my dad bought me an Amiga uh, as a like Christmas gift. And he said, well, maybe you can you know get started. And it was all terrible software, <laughs> you know, these things. But it was kind of a miracle as well. And so I was like, most important thing for me probably is to learn how to type. And so I used it mostly to learn how to type so I could type fast and then later, you know, get into Unix and all this stuff. But as I got a little uh, familiar with where I needed to go in the future, then I packed my bags and moved to Los Angeles and arrived just when all the companies that I'd watched the reels just all went out of business at the same time. It was like, Man. boom. And long story to that, which I won't go into, but the fact is I arrived to a dry Hollywood where then there was a writer strike. And I was planning on working the first year of college. And then after that first year, I was planning on working in the industry. But there was no industry for computer animation at that time. And Rhythm and Hughes was one of the fallout groups. The process of it fa just fascinated me. And when I saw the tools of how people were doing it, I, I managed to see that in a conference that was at Jacob Javits Convention Center in New York right before I came to California. I was like, wow, I get it. Like, I got 3D. And because I had been studying painting for so long, and illustration, that's all about, if you're doing photorealism, it's all about understanding how light works as sort of a physics, which doesn't mean you understand, you need to understand the math, but you need to understand the principles. Otherwise, you'll never be a photorealist painter. Right before I went to CalArts, I thought maybe I'd be a movie matte painter. As I was looking at the ILM book, I'm like, these guys, you know, doing these matte paintings were just genius and awesome. And, but then when I saw 3D graphics, I was like, no, there, because they can actually become alive and a painting can never, mm. you know, I mean, you know, with post processing now and stuff like that, we can bring paintings alive. But at that time it was one or the other. Yeah. And so I just got fascinated with animation and I realized, well, that means I'm going to have to understand film and video. And where did the guys who won the Academy Awards for Star Wars go to? A number of them had gone to CalArts. So I went back to school in CalArts and uh, spent a couple of years there. And the industry was still dry, was still um, struggling. No CG companies were interested in hiring like a person who was just an artist, so to speak, you know, not like a computer mm -hmm. science major. I'd start talking to people early, like Rhythm and Hughes and others at the time. And they'd be like, yeah, you want to be an art director, not a technical director. I was like, no, I, I want to be hands on. You know, yeah. I, I want to be using the machine. Like I, I was doing a lot of retouching with airbrushes, too. And I was like. Like an airbrush usage, because I remember one of the best guys in the world, the airbrush, he goes, you want to know how to use an airbrush? Well, the first thing you do is you take it home and you take it all apart and then you put it back together. And maybe you do that a few times so you totally understand how it works. Because if you don't, you'll never be great at airbrushing. And I was thinking the same way about the computer. And I was like, I'm going to have to understand how this 3D software stuff works to really make the most of it and not just be a guy who has a vision but doesn't know the technology. and then 
maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Hopefully you hired good people. Right? Or, <laughs> yeah. In the scheme of things, you know, that's the, the long answer to a lot long story <laughs> that, no. that, that got me to Hollywood. In the end, you were at Riverman Hughes for five years. Five years? Yeah. yeah. And that was obviously, this is, you know, you had several roles after leaving uni, but this was yeah. one of the most prominent. Well, this was the most prominent one before you founded Oddworld. What was it? So, Riverman Hughes, what was it like? Were you able to apply all that knowledge or was it just this huge learning curve all the time? I had some trouble. I just want, I just want to apply it to get in. I was working for an artist in New York named Jack Goldstein. He was a pretty significant fine artist in the global scene. And he did these real photorealistic type big canvases. And I worked for him for a while. And I wound up with a portfolio of these kind of his paintings, which were like these big canvases, photoreal. And then some of the stuff I was working on, which was photoreal. But when I came to L.A., it's kind of embarrassing to say, and I didn't like it at the time at all. But they were like, aren't you an actor? You know, and I was like, mm, no, man, I like uh, making shit, you know. And I, I didn't have glasses and stuff. And, and I remember I bought a pair of fake glasses just to try and look more studious. Because really? I, yeah, it wasn't being taken seriously. And then I found out something, which was someone told me, they said, hey, you, you uh, applied at such and such. I said, yeah. And they said, you're full of shit. And those weren't your paintings. And I was like, hey. Well, I, I was honest about everything that was in those paintings, you know. And even when I was doing a big canvases for Jack Goldstein, we'd do the whole piece because it was it was kind of like being the cameraman on a Scorsese movie, you know. It's it's mm. his movie. It was his art. It wasn't about his hand made certain strokes. It was about the ideas. And mm. so we had kind of a factory make it. But I was like, people didn't believe I made it. And I was like, and I think it was just one of those times where people that were that excelled um, unless you went to art center or something, you understood there was a way to get into film or you were connected to Henson or something like that. You know, they just figured you wouldn't be there. So that, mm. so I was told that people thought I was lying about my portfolio and uh, that really upset me. Uh, Sherry, never forget this because she had seen some of that work later replicated, but I burned all the work. I burned mm -hmm. all my remnants of the work because I went, if this is going to haunt me, then I need, that work that they're doing, if, if they don't believe me, I can't do anything about that. So how, do I, how am I going to beat that? Mm. And, uh, you know, so I went and did a stint in aerospace because that was the only people that were hiring. And, mm. um, and I just happened to be in a perfect place at the perfect time. And I needed the money desperately, too. It was one of those things where, you know, it was 1989. And I go in to show some work at aerospace to uh, do visualizations under the Reagan presidency for the space weapons. And uh, they called it the Strategic Defense Initiative. The short term was Star Wars. <laughs> I was like, wow, <laughs> this is not the Star Wars I wanted to work on. You know, but, this isn't how I imagined it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay, but they got the machines, you know, and, and they're doing cool projects. And all they want to do is make them look better. And I can, I can do that, I, I think. You know, I know where I can copy the manuals. Right? So I wound up going into aerospace for a little while to build a reel that would get me taken more seriously in Hollywood. And mm -hmm. then I went back to Rhythm and Use because they were the, I thought they were just the cat's meow, you know, I mean, they were doing amazing stuff. And, uh, and then that fo finally got me in there with a reel from aerospace, but my paintings weren't getting me anywhere because they, mm. they didn't believe I made them. Dude. Well, how would you do in that situation though? If someone's not going to believe the work you've done is, you know, the work you've done, what can well, you do? Um, you know, I, th I think that's not that uncommon a problem, no. but I think the answer is, who is it? Kennedy said, life's not fair. Mm. And so I think we have the capacity individually, if we're taking ourselves seriously enough to overcome those kind of obstacles. And I, I did it in a, in kind of a, what I was thinking of was almost like a metaphysical way. Like I need to shed this past life. I mm. need to just not think I can rely on it anymore. And I need to get my ass really in gear and figure out some way to develop a reel of this kind of work if I'm ever going to be accepted into those doors. Mm. To, to give it some clarity, I was so concerned of, uh, I saw a lot of people like ruined by the IRS and things like that when I was living in New York. You know, I like real horror stories. They cheated a little, but that was 20 years ago. But then the taxes and the fines and the penalties, and now they were broke, you know, lose their businesses, things like that. And I was like, well, I don't ever want those things to happen to me. So 
how do I get a little savvy on what's going on? And I had learned enough from the art world to know it was all about the attorneys and all about the accountants and the dealers and all that. That was all downstream. But really, mm. at the, call it the boardroom level where the deals are made. It was a different reality that, for the most part, artists didn't want to understand. And I think that's largely true throughout history. Mm. That, you know, the day of you know, whining in the corner about how the world's not taking you seriously and cutting off your ear or whatever it might be. No one's taking that seriously anymore. And so maybe if you're a musician, like maybe if you're a musical act, but beyond that, no one wants to hear it. They want to hear about winners, right? Mm -hmm. We hear about the winners of Silicon Valley. We don't hear about the losers. And just like Hollywood, we see the winners and they're celebrated, but we don't hear about the losers. And in both cases, those are enormous graveyards of careers Mm -hmm. that never went anywhere. And uh, they're just not worth writing about. And no one's really interested. That's where the real meat of the great stories would be. So what I was doing was I was reading a lot of biographies on, on business people at the time. And Japan was real hot at the time. And they were hot in computer graphics as well. There was a company there called Poyo Lynx was doing some really unique things. So I was like, when I was an illustrator, I had probably invested, you know, maybe a thousand dollars into airbrushes and compressors and paints and oils and and uh, sable brushes and you know maybe a thousand dollars stuff, but I was ready. That would have facilitated most of my career, mm-hmm. right? Just that set of tools that I could have, you know, maybe with light boxes, some cameras, other stuff. Maybe it went up to fifteen hundred dollars or maybe two thousand dollars. Well, now in the computer graphics, in order to sit behind a machine, the hardware itself at that time was about $80,000 just for one computer. And then the software itself was another 80 ish thousand dollars. So you had to have, it was a $160,000 paintbrush that would also need a system administrator to keep it, keep it running well if you weren't one yourself. And so I was like, now you're into business. You're not just into like, I'm going to do great work. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make art directors happy. Eventually I have a nice <clears throat> portfolio. I can, you know, have a life. Now it was like, this is significant investment stuff, but investment that, you know, I had no hope of, of securing. And so you were just seeking like, where can I get the work done? But at that price point, I was reading biographies to just have a better semblance of business because really my parents didn't understand it at all. Mm. You know, like at all, <laughs> they, were, they were just, you know, common lower middle class people surviving, you know, good people. But they didn't have a business bone in their body. They didn't have mm. economic, you know, financial management. And uh, I realized I, I'm going to have to have more of that knowledge if I'm going to use these expensive tools, particularly if my dream is to use them creatively. And so I had to have a different level of understanding, you know. And it's not something like I think I was kind of terrified enough by the world, the economic stuff going on. Uh, and so I really forced myself. I was reading a lot of books. Like I never did martial arts, but I was reading books about martial arts for the mental stamina, the things that were unintuitive to me, but I just had to get my head around it, but they were unintuitive. I'd, I'd listen to these like Shaolin masters and stuff. <laughs> it was, it was kind of like Star Wars, uh, you know, Jedi uh, mantras or something. That discipline gave me another advantage that I think a lot of creatives weren't as much investing in. And in that realm, I was inspired by, you know, the universe is the intellectual properties built by Disney, Lucas, by Hanna-Barbera, by, you know, Jim Henson. So uh, I just had to extend that discipline and suck it up, man. And it was not fun. Like, who's on to it? And I'm like, yeah, that's for business people. And you're like, but if you don't learn that, you want to get mm-hmm. into business, you're going to get screwed. And that's kind of mm-hmm. a lot of land. It's like... Uh, naivety and business don't go together very well, right? Some people get lucky, but, you know, everyone will tell you it's not as easy as it looks. You kind of even did it yourself eventually. So obviously from r and you went on obviously to create for Odd World Inhabitants, which is, is, it feels like quite a leap because we haven't really spoken about games, your passion for games at all so far. So, I mean, like, I suppose the best question to ask you'd be like what led to you going from r and where we've spoken about art animation movies and all these different influences to then being like do you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna create i'm gonna create a video game company <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's even look at no one i mean hardly anyone in the in the film business that i knew at the time you know they were like what the, what the fuck are you talking about like <laughs> why would you do that you know you got a great career 
here's the, the story. I, I've told this one before, but it's really right at the nucleus of why. So I was quickly coming to learn that Hollywood, let me just say, Rhythm and Hughes, amazing place, amazing people. It was the founders. I just so much respect for, you know, and um, I remember when I, when I went to work there, they said, when I applied there, they were like, what do you want to do in five years? I was like, started my own company. <laughs> like, they were like, this guy's such an asshole, but he does good work. You know, at least I had gotten in the door. <laughs> and five years later, we started Oddworld. I just yeah. didn't know it would be a game company. And here's how that happened. So another long story short, I was quickly realizing that there was two classes in Hollywood. There was above the line and there was below the line. And what that means is above the line is like, uh, people that are in on the royalty stream on the back end below the line is people that just get paid for the number of hours that they worked on the project. So that would be illustrators below the line, um, extras below the line. Uh, most of the the unions uh, people, I'm talking like Teamsters and you know gaffers and and uh, Best Boys things like that were all below the line. Most of the crews are below the line, and the actors, the writers, the directors, if they were good. If it wasn't their first shot out, you know, uh, they might probably participate to some degree in royalties and things, which wasn't even happening before United Artists started, uh, you know, in the history of the film business. And so what I was realizing was uh, we were doing an enormous amount of work. I, I say we, I mean, effects companies. We're doing an enormous amount of work, sometimes being the highlight of the show, Always had to be a good story, right? But there was no above the line participation. It was all service work, which meant a lot of times clients, which in that day, it was mostly advertising and the occasional movie. Because before Jim Cameron's, you know, water weenie in, uh, we call it the water weenie in uh, The Abyss or Arnold in T2 or, or you know, in T2 with the uh, liquid. And so I was doing my best to try and network and Finally, it was, you know, at Rhythm and Hughes, I got to work with Sid Mead. I got to work with Ralph McQuarrie. I got to work mm. with these people. And they're like, well, you're the art director. Like, would, would Ralph McQuarrie, Sherry hired him because she had worked with him for years. And she goes, look, he's going to help us on his project. It was a theme park project. And, you know, you just need the art director. I was like, what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to art director Ralph McQuarrie? Are you kidding me? Like, you know, I was totally intimidated. You know, so I was just like, Ralph, this might seem really embarrassing. You know, but uh, you got to help me out here. You know? Like, how do I direct you, man? I mean, I know what the shot needs. I know what the director from Universal <sighs> means. But, and he was probably one of the sweetest human beings, you know, you'd ever meet and brilliant. And so I was like, how do I take this medium and turn it into something that can actually be sold to the public? Because that's the key. And in Hollywood, they go, well, you might have made all the effects, but who wrote the story? Oh, that wasn't you. So you're, you didn't do the content. And that's actually a fair critique, right? Because bad story, you could have the best effects in the world. You know, it's not going to make a difference. And so you weren't considered a content creator. So I was focused on two fronts. One, how can I help Rhythm and Hughes to become content creators? And I was like, where can Rhythm and Hughes, you know, get positioned to make that first movie? Because if you can get there, and this is before Pixar released Toy Story, and Pixar at this time was still trying, they were doing short films and beginning to win Academy Awards, but not that much earlier, like the last couple of years, they were still selling medical uh, imaging equipment for MRIs and stuff. Those guys really, you know, talk about discipline and focus and one ambition that they wanted to achieve. They did it, but it hadn't been done yet. And so I was like, eventually anime movies are going to be CG. And even at that time, everyone in Hollywood was like, there's no money in anime movies. So Disney wasn't, it was pre-Katzenberg days where the kind of animated films got picked up again. And they just didn't believe it. They had Secret of Nim. They had uh, some others uh, that came out at similar times. And they just didn't have the success. You know, animated movies aren't a thing. That was the perception, you know, going into the 90s. And one, I'm like, we can't get whole movies. No one's going to finance whole movies. But maybe in theme park rides. Now, I had just come out of aerospace. And that really started losing a lot of money aerospace or as you say you know shrinking when the 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 wall came down in berlin so all of a sudden the military sector the industrial military complex companies plane you know jet companies uh, 
they were building big simulators for mostly military application, training tank drivers how to drive, training war in simulations. And I had early eyes on on that stuff. And I saw like $14 million Evans and Sutherland fully enclosed dome simulators where you'd be in a cockpit and the computer graphics from like 12 projectors were filling the dome. And it was good, man. I mean, you That's were like, crazy. wow. Right? And that was in, in the 80s. So it took like, you know, $14 million hardware to simulate that experience that today is far surpassed by like EVE Online via Oculus, right? Like mm. a whole nother level of, of uh, capability. But at that time, it was mind blowing, you know, so you're truly transported into a world. And what I saw was that these industrial military complex companies were looking for new markets for all that tech. And the logical place was theme parks. So I don't know how well that history is written, but that, that was a big part of, if you went to the theme park conventions there, it was a lot of aerospace technology companies mm. that were building simulators. I was like, whoa. And let me get this. So a theme park attraction is typically like a haunted house or a roller coaster if it's an action park, right? And you get it. And then hopefully it lasts, you know, five, seven, 10 years. And then it's just spent. It's the same ride, right? Mm -hmm. You might have changed the queue line or something like that. It's the same ride. So it's kind of disposable hardware. The idea with the simulators and motion bases that could be programmed to either interactive film, which would be too much money, right? Interactive live or pre-canned, which became ride films, simulator attractions. Who I eventually started Oddworld with was Sherry McKenna. She had, by the time I was at Rhythm and Hughes, she had become like a queen at producing these things. And she was also ran those CG companies that I had seen when I was in New York. She was at Universal and I was trying to convince her because they had a project then, which was a Hanna-Barbera project, which was this theme park simulator attraction and Rhythm and Hughes, they booked it at Rhythm and Hughes. And this is before I got the job there. So I knew that that project was at Rhythm and Hughes. And I knew that this woman, Sherry McKenna, was the producer from Universal. And I was like, I got to get into Rhythm and Hughes. You know? So <laughs> when I went there, I was already thinking that this military industrial complex technology was going to go into entertainment. And it would mm. be in a short film format. Now, this is key because there was no market for short films. So Pixar was being financed by jobs to make short films just so they could win Academy Awards. It was just for credibility, right? But it was not cheap and there was no market for it. They weren't making money on those. There was nowhere to sell them. Who's buying five minute shorts? Well, at that time, no one. And I saw that theme parks was a place where maybe we could start actually telling the stories. And if we could do that, we would then be considered content creators, right? Yeah. At the same time, I'm wondering like, well, if that well doesn't work out, what am I going to do? And, and I started designing with some brilliant people at Rhythm and Hughes. Film level at that time was up to 4K paint system. I'm starting to make these paintings. And I was really fascinated that these computers, computer graphics, could help us to visualize something I had always loved, which was prehistoric worlds. And this was before the company in the UK it was the motion picture company, I think was it the CG company that made the dinosaurs series, I... was, you know, went big globally for National Geographic, I think, or the BBC. And so I was like, wow, virtual worlds. What if you could see landscapes and dinosaurs in them? And they were just like, like Hollywood, you know, but like real, like you could hang it on your wall, you know? And I was looking at these Michael Weiland paintings. It was like the, with the whale guy. He does all the big murals. And if you go into any gallery in Hawaii or California, you know, it's going to have Michael Weiland paintings for sale. <laughs> Limited edition prints. The guy was multimillionaire for making whale paintings and dolphins. And uh, so I was like, well, maybe there's a way to create a business in content creator is going to be a longer haul. You know, we've got to get an industry to agree that we can be making motion pictures with CG. And that hadn't happened yet. So it was like, okay, well, that's one bet. And hopefully that happens. I'll do everything to work there. But on the side, I should start making some of my own paintings that maybe I could turn yeah. into a limited edition series and start a side business, you know, but like some artists are doing today more and more. And so here's what happened. <laughs> the clinical <laughs> moment went like this. I was uh, having a lot of problems getting the, I could get like 20 different types of blue out of the screen, but I wasn't able to get it out of, the prints. And so this was still 
I started working with one of the very top guys at Disney who was controlling the printers for all of their theme park cells that they would sell in the shops and across the galleries across the world. And, uh, and he was like a, a mathematical genius on um, mixing inks and how, how the, the laser printer should do this stuff. And it was really hard. It would only print up to four feet. I wanted them to be eight feet. And I was, you know, I was, I was struggling through all this stuff, but still, you know, focused on getting there. And one night I'm, I'm sitting in our apartment in L.A. I'm imagining on the wall one of these paintings at the time, admittedly, I'm like smoking a joint, right? And the window shades are all closed <laughs> because it's totally illegal at that time. But I was like, you know, sitting <laughs> tidied up, smoking a joint. And I'm imagining what this painting will look like in a gallery if I get it painted out right. And it was this, you know, dinosaur painting of uh, Plesiosaurus. And so I'm imagining the frame and I'm having it built at the moment. I'm just always doing this, right? You're visualizing what you're going to manifest. I'm imagining the painting on a wall. And I swear to you, in my mind, I said this in the Harsh Technical video. So if anyone's <laughs> heard that, I'm, I'm apologizing. But in my mind, I'm seeing it. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what's that? And so if here's the painting on a shelf right next to the painting, kind of like where the artist document would be in a museum, like who the artist is or what the, the story to the painting is is a uh, little shelf and it's got like an Atari joystick controller sitting right there. I did not put it there. It's just in my mind, I see that it's there. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And, <laughs> and, I, and in my mind, I go over and I grab it. And as soon as I grabbed it, it was the painting I was working on and moved it. All of a sudden the painting came to life and the thing was swimming. And I just went, Oh my God. Like it was one of those moments where I go, everything I do can be animated in CG and come to life. Why am I painting? Why am I focused on the single image when all of this can come to life? And I have been always trying to emulate more life into any animations and stuff. And I think a lot of my attraction to the natural wildlife, especially the spawning pools and fishing and catching snakes and all kinds of crazy shit uh, <laughs> really made me look at life forms and I had learned now to look at them like an animator. Uh, like we'd be walking down the street with a guy. I remember when I was walking down the street with uh, Chris Holm, really amazing talent. He was a founder of Malibu Comics amongst, amongst other things. Uh, he worked on just projects with the Odd World, Apes Exodus and stuff. He played a major role. We're walking down the street one day going to lunch. And I said, look at those two dogs. He goes, yeah. And the, the one dog, the bigger dog was on a trot, right? At one pace. And the little dog had to go from fast to slow. So as they're walking, this one's like doing this the whole time and he's changing gates in animation. I said, look at the little dog. The big dog's in a one steady gate. The little dog has to like shift gears and then slow down and then shift gears because he's caught between gates. And he looked at me, he goes, I never would have seen that. And I was like, well, you know, the more you study animation, like everything you start seeing that way. And so at that moment, it hit me. And I can't remove THC out of the equation because it was definitely a factor, but it was like the creative process is a really weird thing. And mm. uh, sometimes you get information like a lot of script writers will say, I got so into the characters that they started showing me what to do. Wow. And that happened to me as well at another time on some other things. But without going into that story, that's when I realized it could all be interactive like mm. The Nintendo machine, now at the time, the SNES had just barely come out. And uh, the NES was what people were still playing, like Mario, right? There was a lot of people playing those games that were making computer graphics. And I, I wasn't that interested. I, you know, my father had been involved with ColecoVision. I had a ColecoVision. It's another story. But I wasn't that much of a gamer or anything, except for arcade games i was heavily into i loved them because they were more fast and furious and you know you could always beat that last score or maybe <laughs> post your name but that's when it really hit me that mm. the future was interactive i had been doing these metaphorical equations on pseudo equations on if this is moore's law if this is computer's power how long does it take before that 14 million dollar evans and sutherland flight simulator is the nintendo system mm. and then i just started comparing all that and i was like it's right around the corner like yeah. that's close. And I don't think anyone, well, you know, in, in the world I was in, no one was seeing it coming. Yeah. Except like the guys leaving ILM and starting rocket science. I don't know if you ever heard of that company, but it was right around the time when Trip Hawkins started announcing 3DO, which was going to be the first 
CD based game system. It wasn't actually yeah. the first, but it had some 3D graphics power. And I realized that the system wasn't going to work because it was underpowered. If you were coming out of, you know, Hollywood computer graphics, you knew that. If you were coming out of the game industry, maybe you didn't. But the game industry knew a lot of things that Hollywood didn't understand. We were still spending a night to render one frame. The game industry had to make everything run at minimum 30 frames per second or PAL 24 frames per second, right? So NTSC was 30, PAL was 24. But that had to run in real time. So I started getting to know people in the game industry. And because I was working on you know, Hollywood visual effects, they were all really interested. So people opened their doors to me and were really nice. And you know, young people my same age, and they would uh, be like, hey, you should check out this or look at how we do things. Come on down to Virgin in Laguna and see how we do things. And when I saw that, I was just blown away because I was like, it's a miracle what they're doing with 56K <laughs> of memory. They're turning it into a 100-hour gaming experience. Mm. For us, we're spending a million dollars a minute for linear experiences that never change. And, and for the most part, people might watch twice, maybe three times, right? Yeah. And I was like, that's a brilliant ratio. Like if you talk about I'm making visual effects that can be played by the user to not only be the length of a movie, but as long as they want to keep playing, as compelling as we can make it for them. I started figuring out we could make about 17 minutes of various cycles of characters running. Like let's just say this. If it was a 17 cycle frame cycle of a character walking left, this is using bitmaps, you know, like traditional animation, but pre-rendering CG and then playing it back the way Abe's Odyssey was done. If we started doing that, we could have that 17 frames not be a half a second of linear animation that never changes, but that mm. could be a guy walking left forever. And it could be a guy walking right forever. And yeah. then he might be able to climb in between forever, <laughs> right? And it was like, wow, I was just fascinated with the idea of breaking down characters into pseudo virtual life forms that would have a motion vocabulary that made sense. Now I was playing games, doing research on games like, you know, Flashback, the first CD-ROM game coming to you know, <laughs> the Sega, Flashback. right? The Sega. Yeah. <laughs> Genesis. That was my favorite game in the Genesis. It was a lot of great games, but that was my favorite one because it really made me feel like I was a little more in a movie. You know, mm. like the backgrounds were really important and it wasn't just fast moving stuff like I liked in the arcades. It was it was a different type of experience. And so I got really interested in can we make how many cycles of animation can we make that will constitute at least a 30 to 40 hour experience? How many backgrounds do we need? So I started thinking it differently, nonlinearly from linearly. And I realized that the gaming world was going to change really fast. And I was, mm -hmm. and I started convincing Sherry McKenna, and that's a whole nother long story. But it came down to I was like, Sherry, games, it's going to be three billion dollar industry in the next two years. Three billion dollars. I mean, today that's like what hedge fund managers make in a week or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, or, or the new uh, uh, bills being proposed in in Congress. You know, we need three point five trillion, you know, unaccountable <laughs> funds. And you're like. A billions of dollars seemed like a lot at that time. So what's the game industry now globally? Do you know? Is it 185 billion? It's crazy. And it makes it makes a lot of sense without going into the full analysis of it. But I could see that that was going to be a place where if I could get ahead of it right before it hit, the problem in the game industry in the day was that large teams were not common. Mm. And with scale comes big management challenges, you know. And uh, pipeline differences, like it's a lot different having six people work on a project than 106, right? It's a lot yeah. different. And so I was like, well, we have those skills. And then at the time, Jurassic Park was being made, and I was trying to befriend uh, Crash McCree and other people that had designed all the dinosaurs. And he was at Stan Winston's. And I was getting these early clips of Jurassic Park that I wasn't supposed to be seeing, you know, the, <laughs> of, the, of the dinosaurs. And I was like, at Rhythm Hughes, I was like, we're dead. As soon as the world sees these dinosaurs, <laughs> we're not going to be able to compete with them. <laughs> so, so then uh, I went into uh, focusing on the theme park attractions to become content creators. And we got closer, but I realized that video games was really the space to go into if you, mm. if you wanted to get above the line. And that meant two things, having your own creative control and also potentially making a lot more money. So it really made sense. And then I thought it would make good business sense. And so uh, 
you know, I told Sharon McKenna, uh, who wasn't taking me seriously at all. She was like, finally, like, well, if you get the money, you know? And so then, uh, I was like, well, I got the money, but you have to close the deal. <laughs> you know? and she, and so she got kind of suckered into it, but that was the beginning of odd world. And it was really that revelation that art could be in interactive form could create a much longer engaging experience while creating a lot less art than mm. if you were trying to make a movie or something. And today, you know, look at games. I mean, you know, GTA or, or uh, Red, Red Dead Redemption, or, you know, they're just enormous worlds and lots and lots of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. So it really changed fast, you know, and it wasn't that long ago in the, in the scheme of things, but technology moves fast. Man, it's fascinating. You know, it's incredible to hear the process and where your brain went. And again, it's this, the theme is like that adapting to where the growth is going to be, right? Like at every single step of what you've just described over the last, like, you know, 40 minutes, it's constant changing your trajectory to match what you think is going to be the requirement and what's going to be in demand. Yeah. And fortunately, my favorite subject was evolution. And I was uh, really sort of studying animations from the skeletal systems outward. One of the stories that I had heard was why the, there was like a giant elk and I don't know what it was called, but it was in Europe and they had these enormous horns, you know, it's like elk meets moose meets just like huge. (laughs) You see them in some, you know, so it was probably the uh, 20 million years ago epic of mammals rising, but these elk, they said they went extinct because they did great on the plains and that could allow them to fight and defend and all this stuff. But when their herds got climate changes, when the herds got pushed into their woods, they got ruined. They couldn't maneuver. So, you know, packs of small animals were taking down these, these uh, giants of the plains, these titans of the plains. And I'll never forget some of those stories. And, and uh, I was like, so that's how they died off, you know? They were doing great. They had all the tools working for them until the climate changed. And Mm. it's really the same thing to what you just said, right? The climate is changing in the industry. And so, you know, some things are hot, some things are not. You got to adapt. Adaptation is the key to survival. I'm of that belief. And it's not easy. And you wish, I just invested in this. Now it's, I'm not (laughs) using it. It was like, maybe, like I remember Disney, some Disney animators were saying, 3D animation will never be as good as, it will never make movies, you'll never make characters. These were Disney animators, right? They were, these were, they were militant about it. Not all of them. You had your John Lasseter's and stuff that saw the future. But they were, you know, like, you know, they'd be in talks and just trash and seas. You'll never make a character that you care about. You know, only sell animation could do this. And I was like, these guys, they're going to go extinct. And what happened was, those that adapted became the highest paid animators in, mm. in CG. Those that didn't, they didn't make it. Right? Yeah. Like the world passed them by. So, you know, being privy to some of those things, I was like, no, we, we have to be malleable. We have to adapt to changing climates, whether they're business climates, you know, and without getting into the whole planetary thing. But the world, if you look at the epics of time, what survived and what didn't, mm-hmm. climate was a huge difference. And it, those that had the capability to, to adapt and those that didn't, that helped me to <laughs> navigate and, <laughs> and suck up the things that I didn't want to do. You know, the things I didn't want to wrap my head around. I was like, uh, but if I don't, I might be that elk. <laughs> oh, know? mate. I lo- honestly, I think it's, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this has obviously come from when you were much younger, when you were saying like, you know, even when you were stuck, you just, you wanted to know where the money was going to come from. You didn't want to be homeless. And it just seems to be that that's the driving force. And then what's happened is actually your decision-making process has been, where is the opportunity? How do I have to with that? So if you were going to summarize your time over the last, like, you know, nearly 30 years at Oddworld, how would you, I was going to say in five words, but I think it's going to be way, it's going to be way too difficult. Like, how would you summarize that journey? Brutally enlightening. (laughs) <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> I feel like that should be a mission statement somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I wish it was easier you know uh, you, you learn a lot and you, uh, you wish you did a lot of things different at times you learn a lot about people you learn a lot about the problems with yourself you know your own issues stand out the more responsibilities you have so you know hopefully you conquer those but I think that's a good summer that's a fantastic summary <laughs> 
I have many moments like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pain and suffering has a really strong way of teaching and leaving a lasting impression. <laughs> do you? Um, I was going to ask you this. Do you think we like? Do you think we learn more from success or failure? I think with a lot of successes, they learned more before they succeeded. You know, there's some cases of luck, but the world's certainly getting more sophisticated and complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and the chasm between those who know what to do and those who do, like, good luck starting anything that would compete with big tech today. You know, cause yeah. it's so, might as well be a different planet of mm -hmm. knowledge and, and skills. But uh, to your question directly, sorry, I think I went off there for a second. I, I have to say failure. I've had, you know, some successes and... I've seen this with other personalities where oftentimes success makes them feel like they were smarter mm. than, you know, the average bear. They, they were smarter and better than others to have that success. Sometimes it's definitely true. But what can come with that curse is you think things that helped you succeed that weren't things that helped you succeed. So you find a lot with people like, let's say, billionaire class of people, a lot of them you know, they're in a realm where they make decisions quicker. They're in a realm where they have power and they can look at something and make a premature decision on it and still survive. When you're mm -hmm. younger and hungry, you're going to have a harder problem surviving with poor decisions, right? So like, how did George Lucas become Darth Vader? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like a part of me said, because they had such grand success that mm -hmm. they didn't, get dinged on their, the issues that, you know, I, I have a belief that we're all here working on our shit. And when we focus on that and we say, wow, I, I did some things that hurt some people, or I meant one thing, but that was interpreted completely different and it didn't serve me well. I got away with managing some things this way before, but in this circumstance, that didn't work. When you're really rich and powerful, I think it's harder to learn your lessons because you're so convinced that you're now worthy of it. Like I think Jeff Bezos, for example, not going to get me any popularity points, but I think guys like that are thinking, no, I'm the richest guy in the world because I'm the, I'm the smarter. Mm -hmm. There's some part of that that's there's some truth in. And then there's other parts. It's like, that's what it's all about for you. You know, mm -hmm. like I remember uh, watching Steve Jobs when he was fading fast at the end, you know, and, he had a family and stuff, right? But he's on the stage hawking iPads on the last months of his life. And I'm like, is that all your life's about? You know, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, Steve, Steve Jobs is an interesting bunch of stories, right? Not a nice manager yeah, at all. And, uh, but their conviction to that they're right has a certain force behind it. And then the, the more success they have, for instance, I was in Hollywood one time and we were, on a new venture, it was between, you know, after uh, 205, when we shut down Oddworld, we were on another venture. I was in there talking and it was a billionaire financer. And he, he just said some stuff and I challenged him and eventually I, I won. But when we left, my agent from CAA said, yeah, but everyone in the room is going to listen to the rich guy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, then fuck that room. <laughs> you know, I was like, if that, if that's how it is, everyone's just a whore to the more powerful. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to play. You know, there's a degree at which we need to, to bend, to be mm -hmm. flexible, to adapt, to cooperate, to be empathetic and to be driven. But when it's all about like, well, they have the most powerful. That's so that's who we're going to listen to. It's like, mm. man, that's yeah. that's part of the problem with Hollywood. That's a big mm. part of the problem with Washington, D.C. and politics. You know, it's like mm. it doesn't matter if they're good or bad. Who's who's more powerful? Who do we suck up to and, and which team can yeah. we be on? And, I, and I'm just I don't play that one well. But it is interesting, the success yeah. and failure thing, what you said, because I think film trilogies are a good way of looking at that. Like you can have, you know, take Star Wars, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone's going to debate this, but you take A New Hope, obviously brilliant. Empire Strikes Back, it's almost like do the second film and you don't remember what made the first one great. And then obviously Return of the Jedi is actually, you know, we remember what made it great because the second film wasn't quite as good. And these are the things we did wrong. I asked Ralph McQuarrie about that. <laughs> really? Yeah, because he had you know just been a key on all three, and uh, he said, "I think what went wrong. I mean, I love the second one, 
right? But that was, uh, what's his name? But it had that tougher, like the entrance with the snow walkers and the tauntauns and the, you know, it was just like the art direction. Oh my God, you know? But the first one, it just has that spot in history, like the first Matrix. But Ralph McQuarrie said, he goes, well, I think, he says what went wrong, but they all progressively made more money, right? So Hollywood's yeah. like, nothing went wrong. <laughs> you know, what it made. <laughs> He said, he goes, everything was about more effects. Everything in every scene had to have more, 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 more. He goes, that's what George was striving for. He was just like, we need to have more. Every, everything needs to be bigger and better. And he goes, hey, I'm not sure that was the right answer. you know. And uh, Ralph was a really smart guy. And I was like, well, what, did the, uh, what kind of power did the TIE fighters and the, the X-Wings fly on? He was like, well, I was looking at dark matter. And if dark matter, you know, and he went into this, <laughs> this uh, discussion. And I was like, wow, man. And that's like talking to Sid Mead. Like, if you ever want to feel under-equipped for a conversation, I mean, sadly, Sid passed. God bless him in all ways. And, and to Roger, who's you know still here, his partner. But Sid was like, he was so smart and so mm -hmm. articulate. And just, like, I felt like, and, and I was fortunate enough to become friends with him. But at times I was like, I need to have a dictionary. <laughs> His vocabulary was so wide. He was so educated, you know, and he had seen so many things. I mean, he was designing the, uh, the airplanes, you know, the, the custom jets for oil sheiks, you know, I mean, he was just in a whole nother level and their yachts and, and shit like that. So the stories this guy had, but really smart people. And, and Ralph had said, uh, I think, it was too much about the effects and not enough about the story and the characters. Mm. Now, I never noticed that because I loved them both equally, honestly. you know, <laughs> uh, I saw a, a similar type story, uh, and I'm name dropping here for sure, but I saw <laughs> Prometheus with Sid Mead. And, uh, you know, and he had designed, you know, he designed Blade Runner working with Ridley Scott. And when we walked out of the theater... I was just floored by the uh, effects and all that, and it, mm. the design and the cinematography. And then Sid said, well, Ridley needs a writer. <laughs> you know, <and> <laughs> like, was, he, he just cut right to the bone, you know, <laughs> really, really savvy minds. But uh, I think the debate with the trilogy will uh, rage on forever. I mean, everyone kind of agrees that the originals are, Better than the new ones, at least. But you, because with Oddworld, I guess this is the thing, right? With Abe's journey, there's been five, you've done five different, not including the remaster. How did you find the reception for, you know, Soulstorm? Was it, do you expect each time to, for them to be received better? Or was, you know, talk me through that reaction. Well, that was our goal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I remember. I'd be worried if it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember uh, going to like writing seminars in Hollywood, you know, and, and they'd say, look, you need to understand, no one sets out to write a shitty picture. <laughs> and, and then, the, the, you know, and they would talk about the business and, and how complicated it was. So we definitely set out. We were trying to do something that, was blazing some new ground at the same time, which was really doing full on distributed development where even the creative process was in the distributed development. And a number of things happened. One, the world changed really fast. So we were working with some companies that were service companies. And once you had Fortnite, which is the latest, but before that it was uh, League of Legends, Mm -hmm. And uh, World of Tanks, you know, you, you go on, right? The free-to-play in social games had completely taken off. What that meant was, I mean, it started making money that shocked them, right? <laughs> like, like <laughs> even the creators were like, holy shit. I mean, <laughs> you know, 100 plus million a month, right? Mm. And before, if a game made that in, in big, big time, you know, I think it was Sonic made $150 million and Hollywood was like, what? A game did what? <laughs> and you're like, these people start making that a month, month after month after month, year after year on the same game. And so they tapped into a new epic in gaming. Ironically, <laughs> you know, epic's a part of it. But uh, and I have a lot of respect for those guys. But that new epic gaming became what I called uh, engagement monetization engines. And in that, a new chemistry was found that made these companies exorbitant amounts of money with live art pipelines that they needed to keep feeding with an expanding audience. Like the audience would grow over time rather than decline, right? And I was like, what? You know, EverQuest did that in the beginning, or maybe SimCity, you know, uh, 
Sims. But that was really a whole nother dimension of, of uh, big money, and that meant big players. So what that did to the service community is uh, production designers and stuff, even though they were still independent contractors, they would just sign up. They're on the tab, right? So they'll get so much oh, money yeah. a month. Retainer. So they retainer, were on retainers. Yeah. And as long as they produced, you know, three to five paintings a month or something like that, they'd get that retainer fee. And if there was no demands for a month, they'd still get it, which was unheard of. you like, illustrators, painters never had anything like that in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. Really, right? You go back and you look at the history of art, like a lot of things changed and opportunities for creative change. But when you looked at what are the rates of something and then you're in multi-year projects, companies will have changes in management. They'll want to be more profitable. And they'll be like, look, if you can't keep up with our League of Legends rates that they're willing to pay us, that Fortnite's willing to pay us, stuff like this, we can't continue a relationship. So there was some of those things were happening and mm -hmm. um, that's life, right? It's kind of, we, we're talking about adapting. So we wound up spreading more over the world. So our best intentions were also confronted by a changing landscape that was changing the rates of service companies. Now we were self-financing, so it didn't make it any easier, right? And we didn't have yeah. like a big uh, publisher going, well, we think we can do this if you do this and that. And so we can go, we can go higher, uh, but we need to have these things in that'll monetize better. We didn't have any of that. So we were just, in hindsight, it was kind of a miracle that we delivered. And it was made a lot more challenging because of COVID. Yeah, I bet. And so our model was, well, we'll, we'll satellite from a hub and we'll manage companies around the world, right? Teams around the world working on specific things. And we'll try to kind of do it a little more like aerospace, you know, and like everyone doesn't have to know the big picture that as long as they do this part, well, then we'll mill spec, we'll fit it all together later. And so there's a, a number of upsets on that front. And we were now for the first time saying we're, we're get engaging a new project, a creative project where virtually all resources will be outsourced. And myself and Benny uh, were on the home team, you know, and Benny was doing the executive producing and uh, Benny Terry. And it wound up that where we started, it was, it was brutal, but um, where we started was we were like, well, we wanted to not work. I was working with primarily the UK and some great, great people there. And they, they, you know, then would start their own company and work with us on the new projects. You know, they had left old companies, but we wanted to keep working together. There's some great stuff there, but we were also like, man, it's brutal trying to manage UK time. Mm -hmm. Right. Like what's yeah. your hours going to be? But what happened to us was we were trying to keep it largely on East Coast time and West Coast time. And we had UK, but we had a pretty good language going with them already, pretty good pipelines going with them already. But then it wound up, started pushing further east. So then it went into Morocco and into Malaysia and Indonesia and a little bit mm. in the Philippines and ultimately Australia, the West Coast of Australia. So it's just like it worse for the time zones, right? <laughs> and that left uh, myself and Benny in a position where, you know, we'd have uh, 9 a.m. calls. We would start at 9 a.m. as the UK is kind of phasing out. Mm. And then let's just say, and then you're, you're trying to deal with everything. But at 9.30 p.m., that's when you're going to be on the phone with the Australians. And that was an average day. And that went on for a few years. So it was, it was really hard. And there's something that I've said before, which is, and a lot of movie directors and producers I've heard say this, which is there's a project you intend to deliver. And then there's what you can deliver. And sometimes that determines, you know, uh, winning and losing big time. Because if you don't deliver, it's all over. We were just a, a small uh, IP that was self-financing projects in a distributed mm -hmm. development environment. And then the world was changing very rapidly behind us. Uh, you know, as we were moving through, the world is cha literally changing. So one, from pricing conditions. And then two, COVID started. We were still having what I would call concentrations of knowledge, skills, and feedback with groups that are all in one office together. So the entire last year of the project was meant to be spent on the ground at free range games and still with other people, you know, doing other portions. But we were going to be in Sausalito right across the bay for the last year, bringing it all together. 
Yeah. And some of the people would come in from other countries and be on site there too. And we'd put them up in hotels and they could hang out in California. You know, <laughs> they liked that. And all that was taken away from us yeah. by the conditions of COVID. And every group that was a concentrated studio, they mm. all went into distributed development too, everywhere on the planet. And mm. you're faced with, can we do this? Now, mm. if, at the beginning of the project, I would have said, there's no way we can do that. If we knew, you know, we would have had a different plan. But it happened, and, and go to your adapt, it just was really, really hard to try and pull everything together when everyone was an individual node in their own home. And, you know, by that time, you know, it was uh, like, you know, 30-ish people on the project. It's just incredibly hard when you ultimately you want to be like to wrap up the previous projects, I would fly to the UK and we'd sit down and I'd be there for a few months and, and we'd dial it in or, you know, at different phases, I'd be there for a little while. And we could have that collective energy, which there's, I don't know how it can be measured, but sociologically, and I'm sure mm. economists would figure out a way to measure like, what's the benefit of that collective mind being in the same spot where... Yeah you're stimulated by the other people in the room. And it's not just someone says going to call or you're going to have a group call or you're going to try and share screens. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Oh man, you know, Zoom is just <laughs> beginning and Slack and tools. And you end up diluting like everything as well, because if you're distributing, then you're distributing again and you can no point you can bring that all back in. It's like, it's like playing a game of football and having no half time. Where people, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Come back yeah. together. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like, what happens then? You just play the same way for 90 minutes. Like it just, yeah. Man. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's things I would certainly like to, to uh, have changed about the game, but honestly, it, people worked really hard. Some people suffered tremendous hardships around COVID family members, things like that. Other reasons. It was a long project for us. You're doing your best to try and feel a collective team, you know, when you're so mm -hmm. distributed and so in some ways, you're, you're making an extra effort to try and be human in that process. And then tragedy happens and it's really disruptive, you know, without going into specific cases, because I think it's a lot of personal stuff. It's a miracle we delivered. We, of course, you know, I would have liked to seen uh, that we released with some other conditions, but we released, we had deals. I mean, there's so many unspoken things about when do you, when do you have to release? Who else helped with the project? What's the expectations there? So, you know, just on one of the things, um, we knew that we were going to have to do some fast patches, but we didn't know exactly what they all were. And we just, you know, it was, it was really hard to get there. But what happened was because we had had a deal for a free month on Sony, well, originally that month was supposed to be January. Now, in January, there was only supposed to be like a couple hundred thousand PlayStation 5s out there. But because of uh, conditions, we didn't release until April. And so now, right away, we had three and a half million people playing the game. And we were expecting actually a, a much smaller number that we could address. It's beautiful that devices are now connected now because you're always going to learn something that you didn't catch in debugging. And as a small outfit, you, you don't have the same resources to go after it, you know, like a big pu publisher was. With three and a half million free players right away, which are actually the most brutal as well in terms yeah. of reviewing, you know, free is, you know, you're, you're attracting a lot of different people who are just taking advantage of free. We learned really fast, you know, every, we, we started getting, you know, we just didn't expect that type of scale at the beginning. So we thought That's we could crazy. address some issues faster than not. And of course, you know, we got dinged for that. But really, you know, I kind of, I kind of love the project <laughs> and some people, some people do. And, and, you know, some people not as much. I'm in this medium because I believe in the power of the medium. And it's kind of like if I was growing food, it would be organic food. It wouldn't mm. be me adding more preservatives to make more money. It'd be like, no, th this is a different type of mission. And I'm really a storyteller because I do believe in the power of storytelling, the power of compelling media and how that can inspire people or yeah. shine light on things that maybe they should be aware of, which is you know, kind of big thing that Odd World's about. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm proud of what everyone did and what happened. And in other ways, I, I wish some things had gone differently. But, you know, you have to adapt. And as we look at the future, that, you know, it shapes the lessons learned. It's interesting because mm -hmm. we were actually talking to some, some investment bankers that were like, and usually those are the most brutal, right? But they were familiar <laughs> with the games industry and they go, no, but you, you survived. You did mm. it. 
See, like we broke some new ground in how massively distributed it was. And everyone would say, you know, you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> <Right? Yeah. laughs> and we're like, well, it wasn't the full intention, you know, it just wound up that way. And then, yeah. uh, you know, but there's a lot of lessons learned. So going forward, you know, I think we put a pretty good stake in the ground. I think it'll have a longer life in time. But the story, see, I, I really like the story because I think it's really relevant to the world we're living in today. Things are not what they appear and yeah. the heroes are not what we necessarily think they are. And so, you know, I'm ultimately more of a storyteller than a, than a businessman, you know, and uh, you win some and you win some, not as much, but just, <laughs> just completing we won. Yeah. Uh, Cause otherwise it just would have been a total disaster for us. Brilliant. Thank you so much, sir. Absolute pleasure. I will say that the views today are those of Lauren on my own. Um, yes. They do not reflect our employers. <laughs> um, yeah. If you would like to reach out to us, you can at gamedevshow at ptw.com. Thank you. I'm happy to come on whenever you want, Luke. So uh, I Thank look forward so. to the next time, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Cheers, man. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Game over.